Today we'll be carrying out a redox reaction, which as you know, is a reaction where electrons are transferred from one molecule or atom to another. You'll be using a titration to figure out the concentration of an acid called oxalic acid. This experiment is basically just a test of your titration skills, as well as your ability to balance a redox equation and use it in a stoichiometry calculation. You've had some practice with each, so be sure to remind yourself by checking out our videos on burettes, pipettes, and volumetric flasks. But for now, we're trying to find the unknown concentration of a solution by reacting it with a solution that we do know the concentration of. We can do this with a titration and the balanced chemical equation. Balancing redox equations is sometimes tricky, so let's recall the rules we learned for how to do it with a simple example that's a bit different than the one in your lab manual. First, split the reaction into two half reactions, one for reduction and one for oxidation. Luckily, this is already done for you in your lab manual. You'll know which is the oxidation reaction and which is the reduction reaction by looking at the oxidation numbers of the various species. If the oxidation number of a reactant goes down or gets reduced, you know that that one is the reduction reaction and the other must be the oxidation reaction. Next, balance all of the elements in each reaction that aren't oxygen or hydrogen. That's because we'll balance oxygen and hydrogen in a unique way in just a moment. Once your atoms other than oxygen and hydrogen are balanced, you then balance oxygen by adding water molecules as necessary. Add as many water molecules as you need to make the total number of oxygen atoms balanced in each half reaction. Next, you can balance your hydrogen atoms by adding H plus ions as necessary. Since this and your reaction is occurring in an acidic medium, and since H plus ions are plentiful in an acidic medium, we know there are lots of H plus ions in solution, and they can absolutely participate in the reaction. Now that all of your atoms should be fully balanced in each half reaction, it's time to finish the job by balancing the charge. For each half reaction, if you notice the overall charge on the left hand side is different than the right hand side, add electrons as necessary to balance it. Remember that electrons are negatively charged, so add them to the side of the equation that is more positive. In this case, I've got an overall plus 12 charge on the left and a plus six on the right. So I need six negatively charged electrons on the left side to balance it out. For the second reaction, I've got an overall neutral charge on the left and plus two on the right. Therefore, the right side needs two electrons to balance out the charge. Now that each half reaction is balanced, we need to put them together. This is ordinarily done by writing all of the components that occur on the left of each half reaction together on the left of the overall equation, and likewise for the right hand sides. However, before we can do that, we need to make sure that each half reaction has the same number of electrons in it. We need to do this so that the electrons will cancel, and we won't be left with any excess electrons in our equation, because that would be very odd. So notice that I've got six electrons in the first reaction and two electrons in the second. Therefore, multiplying the second equation by three will produce a new balanced equation with six electrons. Now that we've done that, we can put our two half reactions together. We put all of the reactants for each reaction on the left, and then all of the products for each half reaction on the right. We can cancel out anything that is redundant, or the same on both sides, and then we're done. A balanced reaction is exactly what we'll need if we're going to predict how many moles of one reactant we had after it reacted completely with another. Okay, so for the experiment itself, select a sample bottle of oxalic acid that has an unknown concentration from the samples provided. Record the number of the unknown, since this is what we'll use to track how well you've done. Using a 25 mil pipette, put a total of 50 mils of the unknown into a 250 mil volumetric flask and fill it to the mark with deionized water. Mix it thoroughly. Then pipette a 25 mil aliquot from the dilute solution you just made into a 250 mil Erlenmeyer flask. Since the reaction must be performed under acidic conditions, you need to also add 60 mils of 0.9 molar sulfuric acid to the flask. Also, it so happens that the reaction you're performing is actually quite slow. So to speed things up, you can warm up the solution by placing the Erlenmeyer flask on a hot plate and warm it to a temperature of about 60 degrees Celsius. But be careful not to overheat your solution. Titrate using the usual 50 mil burette with the standard potassium permanganate solution. While you normally read the volume in a burette from the bottom of the meniscus, 
This isn't possible with potassium permanganate because of its dark purple color. So instead, read the volume from the top of the meniscus. For many titrations, it's pretty common to rapidly add the titrant at the start. However, for this reaction, you should only add a couple of drops at the start and then swirl your solution for a couple minutes. The solution should turn pink after the addition of the two drops, but should turn clear after much swirling. If the solution doesn't become clear again, try reheating it to see if this helps. If it doesn't, unfortunately you'll have to start over. If the solution does become a clear solution again, you can then titrate at a quicker rate until the end point is getting near. You'll know you've reached the end point of the titration when you see just the first permanent pink tinge to the solution. You'll need to repeat the titration until two results are within 0.1 mils of each other. At the end of the day, make sure you clean your burettes, pipettes, and volumetric flasks according to the directions in the appendix of your lab manual. Also, don't forget to empty your unknown bottles, rinse them out, and put them back on the counter. Alright, so now that your titration is finished, you'll know what your initial and final volumes were from the burette. The difference between these is, of course, the volume of potassium permanganate solution you added. And remember, that's the solution that we do know the concentration of. So we take that concentration in moles per liter and multiply it by the number of liters we used to calculate the total number of moles of potassium permanganate. Now we just use the stoichiometry of the reaction to figure out how many moles of the oxalate we must have had if the permanganate reacted to completion. Knowing how many moles of oxalate we had in that 25 mil sample we started with allows us to work out what the concentration of that sample was. Remember though, that's the dilute sample. This dilute sample was actually made from diluting 50 mils of the original oxalate solution of unknown concentration in a 250 mil flask. So, if you've solved for the concentration of the dilute oxalate solution, the concentration of the original concentrated oxalate solution must be five times more concentrated. And with that, you're done.